Hello and welcome to Extreme Academy Live. This is where you come to advance your skills, advance your knowledge and advance your prospects. Thanks for advancing with us. This is week six. We're getting right through this course now. Remember at the end of the series of live streams, you can take an exam. And if you pass that exam, then you'll get a certification from Ex Extreme Networks. You can put that on your resume. You can use that to advance your career. So week six, week six of eight. So we're coming to the end of the series. It won't be long before you'll be getting ready for that exam. Now, there's a number of ways that you can interact with the Extreme team. Um, you can go into chat. You can say hi to us, tell us where you are. Just say good morning, good afternoon or good evening. You can meet and ask questions of the Extreme team uh, on Meeting Pulse and the, uh, somebody will you know, show up the QR code and the URL on screen. You can go there to ask a question. You could answer somebody else's question. We run some polls there uh, just for a bit of fun. Um, so chat and Meeting Pulse, they're there to, for interaction and for help during the live streams. And then additionally, we've extended the Extreme Academy community into Discord. So outside the live streams, you can keep the conversations going, keep the collaboration with the rest of the group and the community going in Discord. So we've also got a Discord URL, Discord server, which uh, we'll put up on screen. We'll put in the chat so you can have that. So if you want to join that, if, you use, if you're a user of Discord and you like that, you can join that server and uh, you can be part of the community. I want to say a special thanks to Ewood and to Miroslav to be, for being our moderators. So they're going to keep the community going and uh, and try it out. You know, we're, we're trying some new things here. So whilst you're using Meeting Pals, you try Discord, just let us know what works, what's, what's helping, what's improving. Give us your ideas, give us your feedback. We're always looking to improve and enhance the Extreme Academy community. Now, there's no, no conversation with me and Isaac uh, this, this week. We couldn't get our audio channel going in time um, to do that initial uh, chit chat that we normally do. So we're gonna go straight into it. So in week six, we're talking about wireless surveys, wireless site surveys. So this is this is so important. This is this is what differentiates a good wireless engineer from a great wireless engineer. So if you want to be a great wireless uh, network engineer, then you need to understand and get to know um, the aspects of doing a wireless site survey. So keep the questions coming, keep the feedback coming on Meeting Pulse. Look forward to interacting with you on there. I'm gonna get on there now with the rest of the Extreme team. I'm gonna leave you in the hands of Isaac. So Isaac, take it away. Let's start week six. Okay, here we go. Man, we are counting down. We are counting, we are counting down. Episode six, two more left. So as you know, uh, and uh, we, we briefly spoke about it in the beginning. Uh, David Coleman, um, you know, author, of, I mean, author of this book, <laughs> author of this book, this, <laughs> this, I mean, in more one, more ways than one, this great book um, he was on last week and he enjoyed interacting. I was quite surprised to see that when he came online and when he was chatting, uh, so many of you pulled back. That's like the chat conversation went dead. Hey, feel free. David Coleman is on and he's commenting, ask questions. I'm going to try and get him on. Um, I'm going to try and get him on Discord so so that he can uh, you know answer some of your questions in fact um uh, he enjoyed being on and when we finished i had a, a chat to him and he asked me what modules were still upcoming and i said to him well we've still got to do the security um the security module which is quite a quite a complex one but it's really really interesting and he said to me oh i'd love to do that um uh, you know i'd love to do the same thing and, and help you with that uh, if you want and i said she's like of course you know absolutely um uh, no doubt so so um because of that we had to kind of uh, rearrange the order so today's one was supposed to be uh, security but instead it's installation and testing and then next week i'm going to have david on and we're going to talk security wireless security you know david is not somebody just who 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 understands wireless i mean he's been there since the beginning so he's seen the evolution of wireless and the wireless standards and 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 that's why his knowledge is so important because he's seen all of this stuff he's seen as the, as the stuff has grown so please 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 
if you have any interest in security in wireless networks uh, remember we the the title of this is building a secure a robust and secure secure and robust wireless networks this is the secure part that you have to attend you have to tell your friends tell tell everybody tell your mothers tell your sisters tell everybody they have to be on next week because I think the content that David is going to share, the content that Academy is going to offer next week is going to be absolutely stunning. Fantastic uh, uh, thing. So that's a plug for, for Academy for next week. But this week, we're going to do a really important topic. On lesson, uh, I think it was lesson four, um, we, we handled the admin side of this, okay? How you would put a proposal together to to get a company to say yes please go ahead we want you to build a solution for us uh, etc and we kind of dealt with with all of that and and you know people said oh it's not very technical so but it's really important now listen so far i gave you homework in in episode four so far only two people two people very bad Two people have come back and, and sent me the, the homework for me to review. So thank you to those two fellas who sent in the uh, uh, sent in the, the homework. The um, um, if you haven't done it yet, watch episode four. Go look towards the end. There's um, some homework that I give you. Give it a go. Give it a shot. Try it. Okay. Try it. It's really important that you do. But we had a lot of admin stuff. Uh, going on in episode four now in episode uh, um, in episode six what we're doing over here is we are building on what we did in episode four right so in episode four you went in you um, you spoke to to the interested parties to the company who wants to wants to possibly contract you or your company to set up a wireless network and you agreed on specifications on on locations on coverage you agreed kind of on all those things and so you did all of that work the company said all right we're happy we'd like you to go ahead and do the next phase and the next phase would be to do an audit now there generally are two types of sites where you would go and do an audit for installation and for 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 testing etc cetera, etc cetera. the first one would be something we call greenfield and that is when you go onto a premise uh, premises where there is nothing okay so somebody puts up a warehouse and you get called in and asked to come in and do a survey so that um, you know uh, um, so that the proposal that you put around can start to take to take shape and so you come in and the 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 issue here it's empty there's nothing going on and now you need to do an analysis to figure out what's going on and how you're going to set up this wireless network the second is where you get called in to a location to go do um, either to troubleshoot for example an installation that somebody done or maybe you did, or maybe a year ago you did, or five years ago, and it's not working any well anymore. So maybe something like that. But generally speaking, it could be a customer phones. They have a wireless network that's just a nightmare that no one can work, and um, they want you to come in and examine and and see what's going on, right? And so you would arrive at the site, and then you would do these tests. So you have existing or brand new. And we're going to cover both of those in this uh, in this episode. So like I normally do when I do this type of stuff, I always read. So I have a big screen, uh, you know, behind my 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 phone, my camera over here. So when I record, I look through the phone and uh, sometimes you'll see me looking a little bit left or a little bit right. But just bear with me. Sometimes I need to read. Other times I'm just guiding myself um to see what content uh you know is is coming up next etc so this i always read from the screen after the session today we should be able to answer these four things when somebody mentions any one of these we should be able to answer them eloquently with confidence knowing what we're talking about so point one why would you want to do a site survey that's the first thing that we're going to try and answer. Why would you want to do it? Why not just go in and put in access points? Well, you know, 
Think about it like this. Let's say you needed to go into hospital to do an operation to your kidney. Something's wrong with your kidney. You need to do an operation. Imagine if the surgeon didn't do any homework, didn't take x-rays, didn't examine you, didn't do any of that, didn't find out if you had, you know, complications, if you could take, a, you know, an anesthetic. Imagine you just get to the operating table and the surgeon says, okay, let's cut here. This, this should be fine. This should take 10 minutes to do and he'll be fine. I've done so many of these before. Do you see the problem? <clears throat> you wouldn't let a surgeon treat you or work with you in that way. And it's the same thing with a wireless network. It's not as life critical for you, it might be, but generally, why would you get somebody to install a wireless network? Why would you go and install a wireless network if you haven't done a site survey, right? These are really important questions. They seem really basic, but I can't tell you how many times this happens. You know, it's like, oh no, we've done dozens of warehouses. We know exactly how this rolls out. No. It doesn't work like that. Every patient is different. Every warehouse is different. Every hospital, every school is different. So why would you want to do a site survey? What does it give you? What are the benefits of do doing that? How does it help you? And how does it help the customer? The customer who's asked. Point number two, common testing tools. You're right. So what are the tools that we're going to use? What are the common tools that we use? We're going to cover that as well. Afterwards, you will be able to say what we need. Third point, site survey light overview. Now, why do I say, why do we have that in, in you know, inverted commas, light overview? When we originally started Academy, the idea was to help people, right? During the shutdown, a lot of people lost jobs, a lot of people, you know, you know, just industries closed down, travel industry, you know, all of those industries closed down. That wasn't the only reason. Of course it wasn't. Other people just, you know, frustrated in their careers. Like every day is a, oh, you hate going to work. You love tinkering with computers, but you're stuck in a dead end job. You want something better. You want something new. You want something different. That was another, you know, type of, of person that we thought would make a difference and, and to whom Academy could be beneficial, right? And then the third was the, the group of people who are thinking of going into IT and thinking, you know, where should I go into? And networking, you know, we were saying, well, networking is a great area because there's always a shortage of good network engineers. So when you go into wireless, if I've been able to inspire you with this course on wireless and you think, yeah, I like networking, but actually I really dig wireless. Wireless is everywhere. It's ubiquitous. Everybody's got, I really want to specialize in this. Well, being somebody who does excellent site surveys is a profession in itself, is a career in itself. You can't just go and do a site survey, and, and I'll cover that more. You know, the more you know about radio, the propagation, the properties of radio, the attenuation of different material types, the more you know about radio and APs and how all of this works, the better site survey professional that will make you because you will have deeper knowledge and you will understand on a higher level. So you can, if you're interested in wireless, then this course or, 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 or the, the, the title site survey, site surveyor, wireless site surveyor, can be something that you can dedicate your career to and become excellent at doing that and become a master at that, right? You can. So I say light because I can't do what three or four years of experience can give you in 20 minutes, 15 minutes. But if I can inspire you, if I can fire you up to think, yeah, that's what I want to do, then that will be fantastic. So is it a comprehensive how to do a site survey? No, but it will give you so much information for you to think about and wonder and maybe get involved and become somebody who's an expert in this area. The fourth point, installation and configuring. So all about that. That's kind of self-explanatory, right? So what is a site survey? Now, some people are land 
surveyors, land surveyors. So you want to put up a new warehouse, whatever, you bring in a site surveyor, a land surveyor, and he goes in and he says, okay, so these are your boundaries here. It goes for 100 meters there. Then it goes this way. Your land is like this. This is how it is. You're going to have to put in, you, do you understand? It's a, it's a career. You can make a career being a, a, a land surveyor, surveying the land. Well, somebody who does site surveys, for the implementation of wireless networks, it's the same thing. It's the process of spectrum and coverage analysis with the intention of planning a wireless network. That's what it is. The process of spectrum and coverage analysis. It kind of says everything within that line with the intention of planning a wireless LAN. Now, um, why? because it needs to provide a wireless solution that will deliver on that proposal that you and your customer agreed on. Remember that proposal from lesson four? Oh, the hospital's gonna have 10, you know, uh, 500 people, four floors, it's gonna have this, there's gonna be a radiology department, it's gotta be this. We expect every guest to use an iPad or an iPhone, so it needs to cover that as well, it needs to be secure for the doctors and the nurses. All those specifications that you did previously, this site survey now is going to make sure that those targets can be met. So it, it normally involves, no, it always involves a, a trip to the site to go and test it, right? And you're going to be walking into there with site survey tools, laptop software, sophisticated software to go and determine what the what the the lay of the land is in terms of uh, wireless, right? The boundaries, the range, all of those things you're going to do. You're going to look at things like coverage analysis. So in in episode four, you know they would have told you if it's let's take the example of a school. A school would have said, well, we need coverage here. We need coverage in the classrooms, in the corridors. We need coverage in the hall. We need coverage. Uh, on the sport field, and they would have given those things. So you're going to go in and you go look at and say, okay, is there a problem, you know, uh, that I can't get the coverage? What are the issues that will affect the coverage that um, that is required? And you're going to go find them out, right? Interference, uh, source identification. Now think about this. If they give you, you know, the floor plans, and again, we'll cover this in more detail, but if they give you the floor plans and all of those things, and you think that you don't have to go on site because you can just work it out from your desk just with a bunch of floor plans, consider this. Interference, okay? If you don't go out to a site, how do you know if there's radio interference? You might be the school might be stuck between two office buildings. Could be. You know, here in Cambridge where I live, there's a school and on one side there's a hospital. But imagine on the other side is another part of the hospital, another division, maybe the radiology department. And let's say they have a wireless network to carry, to bridge the traffic across those two sites because they can't run a fiber cable, right? You just look at a floor plan and say, oh, okay, it just needs 10, 10 access points, da, da, da. It's sorted out. You get there and your wireless network is a disaster. Why? Because the floor plan didn't tell you that there was radio interference from around you. There might be a big power, you know, power grid or power line above you that might affect it. So do you see why these things are, why you would need to do this? You would need to do it to check for interference that's going to mess with your network. The third reason is placement and the configuration of devices. You can go in and say, okay, we're going to put 10 access points in there. Okay, that's fine. But then you get to site. If you haven't done your proper survey, if you haven't gone on site, <laughs> where are you going to put the access points? Oh, we'll put them up there. Okay. Uh, and power? Uh, it's 20 meters up. How are you going to get there? A ladder. Good luck. Right? Important. So these are why, the reasons why you need to do site survey. Furthermore, Site uh, signal propagation is really hard to predict. You cannot say, remember we, we spoke about 
I think it was in episode one or two where, where I drove out to the lake and I threw that log in the lake and you saw, you know, the waves of energy as they as they spread, as they spread out. Right. We saw that we understood how all of that works. But in reality, radio waves, you cannot see. So you can't put an access point down and say, OK, this is how it's going to this is how the radio waves will travel. They'll go in this direction and there and there and everything will be OK. It's very difficult to do that, just, you know, based even based on experience, even based on experience, because you don't know the outside factors. So um, the, the signal propagation is hard to predict. Now, of course, if you have an access point and you have that coverage, you know, the, the map, the range of the, the access point, the antenna, then that, of course, is already going to, to help you. But you know, you need to have that and you have to have the experience of that. Interference is also impossible to, to predict, right? You just don't know. You go into a warehouse, uh, they might have machines in that warehouse and you go in, if the machines are off, great, you do your test, everything works. The minute somebody switches on the machine, your wireless network goes crazy. So it's difficult to predict, Im almost impossible to, <coughs> to predict interference so go on site because you need to do this type of stuff sometimes walls you know uh, you think a wall is a wall right in the in the, in uh, in america they build a lot of these uh partitions hollow walls you know with wood and a lot of houses are built like that uh, in the uk you know nowadays they are but there are many places where the walls are you know the really bulldog british thick you know proper thick walls you know and you put an access point on one side and on the other side you get nothing you can't just look at a floor plan and say well there's a wall there there's a wall here here's the attenuation i know how much it's going to be you can't you just don't know um elevator shafts elevator shafts are going to suck up wireless signal it's really important to figure out how are we going to set up wireless access points to cover around those elevator shafts Everything has its different uh, degrees of attenuation. Another area is glass. Have you thought about glass? You think glass is glass is glass. Oh, you know, the windows, it's just it's just glass. But you get glass. You get double, gla double glazed glass or double glazed windows. You get windows that have got thin um, foils on them, you know, to keep out the UV rays or to keep out the, the, the heat if there's direct sunlight. And all of those things affect attenuation, this radio signal coming in, the radio signal going out. So you get the idea, right? I don't have to cover much more on that. It really is important to do a site survey wherever possible. In fact, please do a site survey wherever it is possible. It's that time. Let's go. Uh, let's go. Um, Take that 60 seconds. Come on, get up off your chair, stretch. You can stay in front of the chair. Look at the screen because there's always a crazy doing crazy things on you. Stretch, get up off your chair, do your thing and 60 seconds. Come on. And then we'll come back in again. Come on, get off the chair. Yes, you too. Come on. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Hope you're stretched, ready to go. Next one, right. Okay. Um, so we were saying it's very important to do this wherever possible. Now, what do I mean by wherever possible? Well, 
generally speaking, if somebody is going to invest in a wireless LAN, they should give you access to the premises. I mean, that's just the bottom line. It's just, just do it, right? Just do it. You need to, because it's going to, the results of the site survey will tell you how many APs you need to put in place, okay? And the positioning of where those APs need to be placed. They might need to be placed up in the ceiling, right? If you've got a false ceiling, well, that's quite easy to do. There might be considerations, uh, you know, um, for example, if it's a warehouse, they, they have to go really, really high up. How do you get power there? How do you run? You know, how do you actually get the AP up there? You know, do you need a forklift? All of those type of logistical things. But site surveys will help you to determine how many APs. If you, if you put out an AP, you do your site survey and you look at the coverage, so, wow. Um, this is really impressive. I've covered a whole lot of range with, with less APs than necessary than what I originally thought. Fantastic. Great. Maybe you can use them in other areas, you know, uh, or spares, for example. We spoke about that as well. The next thing is uh, the site survey is going to help you to create a channel plan, and we will carry on. We will be more specific on this towards the uh, the end of this uh, session or the second session uh, that we're going to be carrying on talking on this about a channel plan. And of course, the other point is um, sometimes, like I said, you might have to join two buildings together, two offices in different buildings, okay? Especially in situations where you don't own the land where those buildings are. So you might have to bridge two buildings using wireless. And so you would go on site and then you would test with different external antennas, right? Which is the one that gets you the best signal from this building to that building. It might be A, B, C. You might have to try. You might have to go and put a mast on top of, you know, these buildings to, to get an uninterrupted view. It depends. So I think you quite clear, you understand why we need to do a site survey and how important it is that we do a site survey. Okay. Do we cover for, do, do we go for coverage or do we go for capacity? Well, <laughs> you actually need to do, you actually need to do both. Remember, um, obstacles, radio frequency obstacles modify the coverage of the, of, of the area, right? So this is what I was saying about the surgery. Every site is different. A warehouse is not a warehouse is not a warehouse. If all you're interested in is packing boxes, Yes, then a warehouse is a warehouse is a warehouse, right? What matters is, you know, can you get trucks in? Can you get trucks out to take your goods away? Does it have proper lighting? Yeah, you got that, you know, shelves are shelves, space is space, lock up the warehouse, that's what you need. But when it comes to wireless LAN, yes, of course, experience is going to help you. But not every warehouse is built using the same materials. Not every warehouse is built using, you know, with the same height, with the same ceiling, with the same ceiling materials. Not every warehouse has power, you know, going all the way, you know, across, across the ceiling, for example, across the roof of this. Do you understand? There's lots of different permutations for a, a warehouse. So everyone was going to be different and the current, the coverage model should be measured or modeled for every one of those. The coverage area will also vary over time. If you think, if you think about that, it will also vary over time. You'll have things like short-term variations. You have a warehouse, suddenly you decide, oh, you know what, we've got too much space over here and our office is too small. So let's move our office. Let's build a bigger area. Let's partition it off. Let's put doors and, and let's put some glass in there so that we can see into the warehouse. When you originally did that, this would be the coverage area. Now it's moved. OK, maybe you put up temporary structures for for whatever need you might have at that point in time. Maybe you have an exhibition. Maybe you decide your warehouse is so big, you want to rent some of it out to somebody else and you're going to put up some partitioning. That's going to change the coverage that will affect the the coverage that you're going to um, that you had originally. Movement of furniture. You might think that that's a small thing, right? Oh, I'm just going to move this desk. 
But you know, because even with mobile phones, you could be standing there talking to somebody and you just turn around and they say to you, oh, uh, did you move? I can't see you. So imagine if a mobile phone can do that to you by you moving half a meter or turning one way or turning another way. Imagine that if you move furniture around, you place a bookshelf, you move it in front of an AP or whatever, that's going to have an effect as well. So even people, people move around. You, you rearrange like the office move. You take people from here and you put them into a different location. You know, it's going to be completely normal. Those short-term variations. What about long-term variations? Again, you know, like partitioning off for another company or so. All of that, all of those things change. All of those things mean that uh, that that the coverage needs to be updated. That you that you need to do these surveys to handle those types of things. Now, this is something that a lot of you are going to to enjoy, right? Because it's a question that gets asked every radio engineer, everybody who buys APs. You know, there there are people that buy APs based on this. Like how many? How many users can this AP support at the same time? Wrong question. It's not how many users this AP can support. If that's the question you're asking, you're on the completely wrong track. If you've done your homework, if you did and watched lesson four, okay, what are the requirements of the wireless network in radiology department? What are the requirements? Well, in radiology, we are dealing with, with x-rays that are 200 or 300 megs in size. Okay, what does that tell you? That tells you that you need to be able to handle the amount of traffic or, or, or the simultaneous uploads for people working over there. OK, so that tells you the type of use case, what's going to be happening in that department, what needs, how the uh, access points are going to need to handle load at that point in time. So how many people can you put on there at the same time? If you are dealing with massively large files that you need to upload. Ask yourself the question, how many can you how many people? Maybe you're not going to get 50. Maybe you're going to get 15 and instead of one access point, you're going to have to put two or perhaps three to handle that type of load. So the question is not how many clients can this access point handle? That's not the question. The question is bandwidth. What is it that those people need to do to meet the requirements document? that you said we need to cover all these people. This is the type of access. If we're using SAP, if we're using a hospital application for client records, etc., how much bandwidth do you need per customer, per client to be able to give the people who are using that technology an excellent experience? That is very, very important. So. 50 is what extreme will generally say, right? We would say that you shouldn't put more than 50 clients on one access point. But remember, this is not a golden rule. This is not something that says apply this across every situation. That is not the case. Can you put 200 people on an access point? Yes. If you want them to crawl and 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 complain a lot, yes, because they can get access, but it's going to be very, very, very slow. Think of the highway, right? In the UK, if you've ever been to the UK or you live in the UK, we have a lot of villages. And in those villages, we have really narrow roads. Sometimes two cars can, can hardly go past each other. Throw 50 cars onto them. What do you think is going to happen? Can 50 cars get through? Yes. How long will it take? How slow will it go to get that through? Do you see the issue? Easy. I know I know this to a lot of you is very simplistic, but I'm addressing an audience that is, you know, from very skilled to very non-skilled and people who want to learn.
So if I can paint pictures in your mind of the scenarios, the situations that I'm that I'm talking about, then you can understand how you can't just say, you know, 200, 300. Can it handle it? Possibly, but very, very poor experience. So in a hotspot, in a public hotspot, for example, what are the typical applications? People are using web browsing, you know, for shopping, online shopping, blah, blah, blah. They use email, yeah? And generally speaking, in, in public places, you would find a lot of people, because of corporate policy, they would be required to use a VPN connection. So VPN, when you establish it, there's a lot of extra traffic that needs to uh, th that go past, a lot of overhead that needs to happen to establish that, that tunnel. So in a hotspot, that's generally what you would see. Perhaps nowadays, people would go to Starbucks or whatever, put on a pair of uh, headphones, and sit there and have, you know, video chats with people, you know, in the corner, whatever, it can become quite normal to do things like that. So that could happen in a hotspot. In an enterprise wireless network, well, definitely you're going to have browsing, you're going to have email, you're going to have um, client server applications, right? Think about SAP, uh, SAP accounting, client server, client server, you upload, gives you back reports, you upload, you do data, you check, you run reports. So there's this always this, this, this very busy client server usage of the network. Databases, also client client server based. Databases connect to databases to go and check information or update information, whatever it might you know be. So it's different. It's it's different to what you'd find in a in a hotspot. And of course, I'm not saying that people in a hot public hotspot don't go and check databases. Don't go. And, of course they do. But in a in a enterprise environment, it's much more concentrated. Much higher percentage of people doing those types of things. Browsing, uh, uh, VoIP, for example, Zoom calls. Okay, in the last year, the amount of Zoom calls that people have done in an enterprise has just gone absolutely through the roof. Made Zoom shareholders very, very happy. But you can see the difference between the usage of a wireless network and why. Coming back to this, why we say, well, you know, fifty is 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 a base average, right, for the amount of bandwidth that you can give every every user based on the document, based on what are the targets that you want to meet. Very, very important. Enterprise, probably depending on, on the task, 15 users, you know, in an enterprise environment, in a public hotspot environment, maybe 50. So you can imagine already when you're talking about MLB, when extreme, you know, which is so strong in the MLB and the NFL, those big stadiums, tons and tons and tons of concrete and steel, you can start to get an idea how many access points one needs to put up to ha to be able to handle a crowd of 40, 50, 60,000 people. It becomes incredibly interesting to, to talk about that and, and, uh, and understand something like that. Remember that bandwidth is not bandwidth, right? Bandwidth that you have on an Ethernet cable is different than what you're going to have on wireless because of the overhead. Remember in, in the last lesson where uh, I was chatting to David Coleman about 802.11ax and you know all wireless has a whole range of data which is just management, not actual physical data that needs to travel, carrying the information, the, the gold, right? Management frames that, that are sent. And so what happens, even if you have a you know, 54 megabit per second segment, network segment, well, guess what? Actual throughput is probably going to be half of that, maybe even less than half of that. So plan, think about these things. That number is very, very reasonable, 50 uh, uh, people uh, per access point. Other thing you need to just consider as well, best practices is try and understand the mixture of clients that will access airtime, that need airtime. When I say airtime, you, you understand that the total available bandwidth in that wireless network, okay? In any enterprise, there's going to be a whole mishmash of devices that are going to be connected. You're going to have laptops. You're going to have possibly desktops. You're going to have wireless, uh, maybe security cameras. You're going to have, um, you know, IoT devices. You're going to have scanners, old-fashioned scanners, uh, new scanners. You're going to have 
all sorts of devices, mobile phones. Everybody comes to the office with a mobile phone, with a tablet. You have a whole range of devices that are going to be, you know, coming in to ask for airtime, coming in to ask for time on the air, right on that wireless space. And you need to understand this. And it's important to understand this because airtime is is really important and think about something like if you have very old scanners you know let me let me talk to the accountants you know the, the accountants the people who sign checks you know those scanners that you bought 25 years ago when you started at the company right and the IT team has been begging you to upgrade and your statement is well it's working why change it let me tell you, it's a pity to invest in a wireless network and keep old technology around. Think about, the best way that I can explain this is think about this. Imagine you have a, a, a highway, let's say with, with two lanes, one in each direction. And this you've probably experienced, right? And imagine there's somebody who's driving a vehicle, but they're driving it at 15 miles an hour. And in the opposite direction, there's a lot of traffic. So it makes it really impossible to overtake. That's frustrating, isn't it? You know why? Because one slow car is holding up all the people behind it. And sometimes these devices, these older devices, they slow down the network because of the technology. They cannot take advantage of the latest enhancements to this technology. So they slow not only themselves down, they slow everybody else down. Sign that check, Mr. Accountant. Go sign that check, okay? Very important. So make sure that you have the highest amount of airtime by updating devices, making sure that they're on the later AC, AX specifications, that will really help a lot. Um, ensuring high signal to noise ratios for each device, right? Minimizing noise floor if you can. Um, minimizing the number of SSIDs. This is very important. I used to think that for a network, you know, you, you should seven or eight different SSIDs when I didn't understand channel, channel uh, CCIs and things like that, co-channel interference, or I'll just, I'll just make lots of SSIDs. Wow, big, big, big mistake. So for airtime, to get maximum use of your airtime, re reduce the amount of SSIDs that you have. Make it really simple. You could have one for guests and one for people, right? Employees in your company. By doing that, you maximize the amount of airtime that you have available for, for data to be trans, uh, trans, transmitted. And of course, that last one is those scanners. Right. Greenfield. Greenfield, a new installation. How would you go about this? Well, you place an access point down and you measure the actual coverage. So, if in your original proposal that you did, you said, I suggest that indoors for the hospital or indoors for the warehouse, for, you know, that we use for this area that we use this type of AP. Great. Then take that AP, put it in there and go and check, you know, the range and the coverage of this particular AP with the tools. And I will cover the tools, you know, in, in a later slide, we will go through these. I will show you those tools and I will show you how you can see what the coverage is. So place an, X, uh, an AP and measure the actual coverage, right? Move the AP. Step number two, move the AP, move it around, move it another 10 meters and go and check the coverage. And then do it again and again and again and again. And you get the point. OK, if it's a warehouse, that's quite easy to do. If it's an office, you know, go into every office, go and do that in every office. In a hospital, it's more difficult to do. A one man is probably not going to be able to do that, certainly not within a, a small uh, space of time. Now, there are many tools and we're going to look at two of the tools, Air Magnet and, and Ekehau. We'll just look at them and see because these tools are, uh, are really specific. Now, the whole site survey is going to start with the floor map, right? 
you're going to be able to get a floor map. Now, most of the times, the company that wants you to come in and install this network is going to be providing you with a floor map. And hopefully, it's got all the measurements and, and you have all of those things. And when you use these tools like Ekahau or uh, Air Magnet or even Extreme Cloud IQ, you'll have to do it to scale. So you get, you import a floor map and then you say, okay, so this is 20 meters over here. The architect said this is 20 meters. So in my app, I'm going to measure this and then you give it a scale and then it scales. And then the software has the intelligence to know, okay, so this now is scaled. This is what we're talking about. This is the, the outside walls, etc. So everything kind of starts with a, uh, with a, with a, with a floor plan, right? And then you're going to be walking around possibly with a laptop. So you plug in a, possibly a USB uh, uh, access point, you know, into your um, 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 into your laptop, and then you <clears throat> turn on your software, and you're actually going to take your laptop and you're going to walk around this. You're going to walk around this this building just to go look at the range. You put your access point, and then you walk around and you go and measure the range. Now previously you would have to do all of this manually, okay? And nowadays with the software, it really helps you. But if you indoors, you're probably going to have to mark every time you know you put an access point you have to mark where it is on the software and then walk 10 meters and mark the strength and again a lot of these softwares they automate a lot of that if you're doing an access uh if you're doing a site server outside outdoors well then gps is going to be your friend right you've got a gps and it will know as you measure these points well the gps is going to tell you straight away okay this is the location that's the location and so you have a really good idea of the coverage that we're talking about um over here um as i said previously do the 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 survey using the access points the technology and the antennas, remember the antennas, really important. Don't just come up and say, oh, we're going to put this antenna. That's what my proposal is that it works. You don't know. Test the external antennas if you're going to link two buildings. All of those things are important. And like we said, Ekahau and Air Magnet. Ekahau, by the way, E-K-A-H-A-U. I think many people on here, you guys can go in and comment, but I think many people on here have already used those tools and are aware of those tools. They're not, they're not cheap tools and i don't think that you get cheap tools when you talk about this type of stuff because it's quite intricate technology that you need to remember you can't see a radio wave but a piece of software can okay they can see them and they color them like this like you see on the screen and that's going to help you um so as I mentioned, the co the modeling, right? If you you can do some modeling in in extreme uh, networks, we've got this application called Extreme Cloud IQ, which is a cloud based management network management system, and within Cloud IQ, you have the option to import a a um, a map, right? Uh, um, a, a layout of um, of a floor plan. So you can import it in. You can do three dimensions. So if you have a building with three or four floors. You can do each one of them separate because there's obviously going to be some bleeding between them, um, et cetera, et cetera. So you bring in your, your floor plan into the application. Of course, you're going to go and scale it, like I said. And then the other thing that you're going to do, the next step that you're going to do is you're going to list all the potential attenuation sucking things in there. So if you have your floor plan and you have doors or you have little offices then you draw the offices and in there you put you know the, those walls you you draw them in and then you go and select from a drop down you say okay that's partitioning that's a solid brick wall that's a glass partition or whatever you then go and you look at your lift shaft okay this is a lift shaft you go from the drop down okay you draw it and then you say okay this is a lift shaft or this is a concrete wall then you go to your windows and you you put put in all the attenuation and these values are known you can get this information on the web so you go and put in all the structures within that warehouse within that hospital it's a lot of work but you go and put in all of this information so that when the software gives you back your patterns it can make an attempt at saying okay the radio signal is going to hit that wall but here it's going to drop by x amount of dbs right because of the attenuation of that material and you can do this in extreme cloud iq 3d modeling of course 
uh, top floor, bottom floor, all of those. Easier if it's just a, a single floor, but no different if it's multiple floors. You just select the floor that you want and you say, okay, let's work on the coverage of that particular uh, floor. The uh, signal strength, of course, is measured in dBm. The other thing you might need to do, and this is <clears throat> based on what I said earlier, is you'd never know the interference um, that's going to be happening over here. And that's why you need to have um, an on-site survey so that you can measure um, if there's outside interference. For example, for a, you know, the, your next door neighbors are talking to each other across a microwave link or, or something to that effect. So I think we'll do, we'll put a stop over here. And what we'll do is we will come back after the 10 minute break that we will take on this. See you after the break. So on this lovely, bright, sunny day, I came out to the west of Cambridge, a place that I had driven past many, many times when I used to travel into Cambridge every single day to work. I used to see what you're about to see and I used to just be amazed because this stuff I love. Radio, radio, satellites. Oh, I can't get enough of this and when you see what you see as I come up this field it's just breathtaking literally your breath is taken away Yeah, that's my little one, Christopher, came on on this excursion with me and 
it's just amazing he loves space he loves star wars he loves everything like that and when he sees a satellite dish i think he's he's as excited as his dad look at that you can walk virtually you know up to maybe maybe 10 meters away from this uh, from this dish if I, if I try to get over that fence i'm sure that i could get there but it's it's just breathtaking and the fact that it's just on the side of the road you just drive past it and there it sits looking into outer space listening receiving radio waves oh man i love this stuff This is the Mullard Radio Astronomy Observatory. Um, it's located in Cambridge and is a home to a number of the largest and most advanced aperture synthesis radio telescopes in the world, including the One Mile Telescope, the Five Kilometer Rail Telescope, and the Arc Minute Micro Kelvin Imager. It was founded by the University of Cambridge and it's an obviously an institute of the Cambridge University Astronomy Department. One of the amazing things about Cambridge University is that the university was founded in 1209. It's the third oldest university, continual university in the world. Only Bologna uh, is older and Oxford is older. Not by far, but Oxford is older. So 1509, that, that means this university has been up and running, teaching people from all around the world about 50 years before the Aztec Empire actually started. It, it's just mind, mind boggling. The observatory was founded under Martin Ryle uh, from Cavendish Laboratory, the University of Cambridge, and was opened by Sir Edward, Edward Victor Appleton on the 25th of July, 1957. They are still, the, the an antennas are still active, uh, the telescopes, uh, the large arrays are still active. The uh, Arc Minute Micro Kelvin Imager, the large array, was built in 2007, is active. The small array was in 2004, is active. The very small array was built in 1998 and then moved to Tenerife a year later in 1999.
Okay, so you get two types of surveys. Let's talk about the first one, a passive survey. When, when you do a passive survey, an application, a site survey application, like one of those two tools that we've mentioned before, it sits and it listens to wireless LAN traffic to detect, for example, active access points, to measure things like the signal strength, and also the noise level, right? How much noise, that's gonna be always very important. Um, however, the wireless adapter that you're going to be using for the survey, this is important, is not connected to an active SSID, okay? This is very important. So all it's doing, it's kind of, uh, it's like a it's like um like a, a network card a wireless network card just sitting there not joined to anything just like an eaves eavesdropping in on the conversation just listening okay what's the noise okay what's the signal strength okay what's this what's that move location yeah that is called a passive survey in opposition to that you have the active um, the active survey, right? And for design purposes, um, one or more temporary access points are going to be deployed to identify and qualify uh, access point locations. This is generally the most common method of pre-deployment uh, Wi-Fi survey, right, that, that you're going to do. So there's a place for both, and we're not saying one is right and one is wrong. There's a place for both of them. One is just listening to what's going on and give you data, and the other one says, okay, let's put the temporary access points in place. Now let's hear what's going on. And in this case, you're going to join that that uh, that network card that's going to be plugged into your laptop, for example. You're going to join that into an active SSID, and then you can do a little bit more um, a gathering, data gathering, right? You're going to measure things like round trip times. You're going to be measuring things like uh, throughput, you know, throughput rates. So if I upload a file or download a file, what is the throughput rate that I'm going to get? You're going to look at any packet loss. Are you losing packets in the transmission of data? Um, uh, and is there retransmissions? Are you having a lot of retransmissions? Active um, surveys are generally used to troubleshoot Wi-Fi networks or to verify performance post-deployment, okay? So if you've been called in to, to do a survey in an existing thing to troubleshoot, you would probably at that point not go for the passive ones. You'd go for the active surveys because the wireless is up and running, everything is running, but there are issues with it and this is going to help you. If your retransmissions are high, ooh, you have a problem. If your data throughput is low, Oh, you have a problem. Let's look at things like noise floor. Um, you know, uh, floor. You know how much how much noise uh, you you your your environment is actually generating. Now, um, during the predictive survey, which is um, something that we also have, the the predictive. This is what I showed you or told you about in uh, in Extreme Cloud IQ. What you're doing is you are. Oops. Let's just go back there. Uh, predictive. What you're doing over here is you are predicting what is going to happen based not on anything other than the attenuation points. So you're not going to be able to see any radio interference from outside or anything else like that. You're not going to be able to see, you know, if you have machinery, for example, on a factory floor, warehouse floor, uh, if you have um, that that's letting off, you know, uh, radio energy and affecting or interfering with your radio uh, signal, right? So uh, the predictive can only predict what the signal will be like based on the patterns of the access points that you are that you are, are putting out there together with uh, the attenuation that you've drawn out but it's never going to take uh, uh, interference from machines from devices uh, from outside it's never going to take that off so the predictive survey or the predictive model uh, um, survey model is is really useful because it gives you an overview, a broad first pass, first look uh, overview at what you might possibly need. 
but it's never enough. You always need the site survey to take you further. So now that we kind of know what a site survey is about, the types of things, the types of, of uh, survey software that you would use to do this, let's talk about practicalities okay practicalities the stuff that you actually need you're going to do a site survey what is it that you're going to have to take um uh to to site well as mentioned because we don't can't see radio waves we need software to help us to do this and so you're going to need software and obviously a Wi-Fi um, adapter, like a, a USB Wi-Fi adapter, right? You're going to need those things uh, at the very least. So predictive surveys, they don't need any hardware at all. So if you're going to be using like uh, Extreme Cloud IQ to do your first pass of the of the floor plan, you don't need any hardware there, right? Because it's not basing that on anything that you've actually done or site. It's just saying, okay, for this space, this is what I predict that we will we will we will need. So you don't need any hardware at all. You could use machines like a, a operating system like Mac, uh, uh, Windows. And of course, mobile devices like iPads and other tablets. Most of these manufacturers have software to run on all of these different platforms, whatever the platform is of your choice. But for an indoor survey, on the left over there, you see what we're going to need. We're going to need a spectrum analyzer, but you need a spectrum analyzer analyzer number two you need blueprints right floor plan of of what this floor plan looks like right because you're going to need to take this floor plan either on your ipad or whatever and you're going to have to walk that location you're going to have to walk upstairs downstairs you're going to have to maybe go down you know uh, you know in in the basement so you're going to need that information uh, to help you to get to get around the place you're going to need some software like the Air Magnet or the Echo How, and those are not the only tools. Those are probably only the two most widely known tools. So you're going to need that installed on your machine as well, the machine that you're going to do your surveys. You, na you need 802.11 client cards, right? When we say cards, it's like a, like a USB you know, dongle that you're going to plug in. So you need to have that as well. You're going to need access points, preferably the access points that you've proposed that the customer use and install at the location. That would be the first first choice would be those access points. And of course, you're going to need power, right? You're going to need the battery pack for that. So if they are powered by by um, uh, you know by by PoE, then you're going to have to find a way. You're going to possibly have to take a PoE switch or something like that with a network cable just to run to to power that access point up. If there is already existing power and the switch, because sorry, and the access point has the ability to plug in power. Not all access points have uh, have own you know PoE access points only have PoE. There are some that are powered by PoE and they might also have power, actual physical power that you can plug. This you would have done in the homework. You would have figured those things out. So you would need that battery pack possibly um, as well to, to power up the accent, uh, that access point and a wireless LAN controller um, that, you, that you might need depending on the solution that you are selling uh, your customer. Hopefully an extreme solution. Then other little practicalities. And these might sound like those are really trivial, but I cannot emphasize to you how important something is like a pair of binoculars. It's You're not going bird watching, but if you're sitting in a warehouse and the ceiling or the roof is really high, and in most warehouses, let's be honest, they are quite high. Excuse me. It really helps to take a pair of binoculars and to be able to look. You know, you see where the light switches are or where the lights are. Just look up, you know, because they could be 20 meters high, literally. Look up with binoculars and you can see, you know, are they, do the, is there a separate power switch for these lights? Are they all wired in? You know, are there any power sockets running along the top? So that's where something like the binoculars can really help you, right? If you don't have the, a cherry picker to take it up to the top, um, that that is definitely going to be useful for you. A 
torch or a flashlight. In South Africa, we call it a, a torch. In America, I think they call it a flashlight. Um, something, uh, I, do I have one here on my desk? I have one somewhere, had one somewhere on my desk. I just had one of these, um, oh well, it disappeared. Just have a, a, a flashlight that, oh, here we go. Something, something like this. Uh, possibly a, a bigger one than this. Put it in your holster so that uh, so that it doesn't fall out if you climb something. But this thing has saved my bacon many many times before. Just you go into places where it's dark, the lights are not reaching. Again, especially in roofs and things like that, very difficult to see. These things help you. Practical practical tip: use something like that. Walkie talkies, two way radios. So it's possible that in smaller sites you would be able to do a um, you would be able to do a site survey by yourself. But generally speaking, when you need to go into a warehouse or a hospital, I mean, there's just no sense in trying to do this by yourself. You're going to need uh, a number of people to do it, two or more people just to help you move a ladder, do this, do that. Two-way radios is the way that you can communicate, right? You know that with a two-way radio, you can have it attached, uh, you know, to to uh, to a harness, for example, or you know, just into a belt clip. Talk to somebody, put it back in there, lock it in place so that you don't drop it or things like that. You also get two-way radios that have, you know, like the security services use that have a a, a cable with a little microphone, you know, and you can talk, wear sunglasses and talk to your colleagues, uh, you know, like that. So do something that's practical for you. Using a mobile phone uh, is probably not always practical. Um, uh, and also a mobile phone can be really, really expensive if you drop it or something like that. They might be a little bit more difficult to hold. So two-way radios, I have a, a cheap set of two-way radios, Motorola. I think they cost me about $150 or whatever it was when I was in America. And they really, really useful. So go for a two-way radio that will help you. Antennas. If you're planning on hooking up two sites together, two buildings together, um, we've already discussed that this would have been in the document. Well, take a number of antennas. Maybe you proposed antenna A or B or C. Take all three of them, take them with you, check them out, put them up, test the connecti uh, connectivity between those, those different antennas to make sure that your site survey produces the best results for what your customer might be. Remember, it's going to be an outdoor antenna. Temporary mounts. Where are you going to mount an access point? If you are if you are planning to mount an ex, an access point, you know, on a on a on a column, for example, uh, on a pillar, be it steel or whatever, you have to attach it there. If you want to try and replicate or get as close to possible as what you are proposing, then put an access point. Maybe take some Velcro. You know that you can strap it to a wall, that you can strap it to a pillar. You can buy belts of uh, of Velcro, stick it on, put it on, do your testing, and then just easy to uh, easy to pull off. So the next one is a temporary a temporary uh, um, a temporary mount for the the access points, and that could you know you could do lots of different uh, lots of different stuff. You don't have to make these things uh, permanent. Digital camera. Most of us have digital cameras on our phones, right? Um, again, you can use that if you are, you know, up, you know, in, in the ceilings and stuff like that. You might be using gloves, which might make it a little bit more difficult to, to do something on an iPad or, or whatever. So in cases like that, you might want to keep your mobile phone, you know, away, locked away. And you might be using uh, a, a digital, a separate digital camera, you know, with tethered so that if it falls, it doesn't fall onto the floor because you might need to take photos to show uh, colleagues later, to, to show people what you saw to describe and use photos, use videos because they all help for you to, 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 provide a better solution to do a better deployment, having all the bits of information. Think of a forensic investigator, right? Take photos, take photos, take videos, don't be shy. Do it because it'll help you. Measuring devices. Um, so sometimes your floor plans might be quite rough. Okay, uh, you you move into a new building. The owner doesn't yet have, or, or move into a uh, customer moves into a building. They don't have hands on the floor plans yet, but they've asked you to go on site. So you don't have floor plans, for example. So what do you do? 
Well, you can go and measure, right? You can go and measure. That normally needs two people if you're going to use something like a tape measure. So what do you do? Buy yourself a laser pointer, a laser measuring device, right? You put it on the one end, you measure, you know, and that gives you really accurate recording. Nowadays with the modern phones, um, you know, you have LiDAR scanners and you can start creating, you know, uh, um, generating your own uh, floor, floor plans. Uh, it's not perfectly accurate down to one centimeter but it's probably more than enough uh, more than good enough to be able to do a site survey please don't get to the site to learn how to use the lidar scanner learn how to use the tool at home practice at home so that when you get to site you walk in you know exactly what to do got the app measure it start taking your measurements and that way create a model of that but if you don't use that a uh, laser scanner uh, a laser pointer, a laser measure, you know, measure device is, and they cheap like 60 pounds, 70 pounds, you buy a really, really good one and very accurate. So if you don't have floor plans, you might need something like that. Or alternatively, you might just want to check that the floor plans are accurate. They should be, but just check, just check, because you also might have, someone might have done renovations and it doesn't appear on the floor plans. So just take one of those with you. Colored tape. And then also a ladder or a forklift. Now, of course, in a, in a house, you might not need all of this stuff. But in a warehouse, a forklift would probably come in really uh, handy to you. A ladder, remember, health and safety is, is the first consideration. Don't climb up a ladder, you know, a 10 meter high ladder, just le leaning up against the pillar. Don't ask for trouble. Don't do something like that. Get someone to help you to hold that ladder firmly or better a forklift or something uh, a cherry picker that can lift you up that you can go and do an inspection and uh, and then come down so that is what you would need to do an indoor survey for outdoor survey a lot of these things are the same believe it or not um, you might still need a torch right believe it or not you might still need a torch so outdoor as we mentioned previously, has a couple of advantages for us, especially when it comes to GPS. Because you're outdoor, you can get a GPS signal, you can get an exact, uh, an exact location. You still need tools. Possibly you might need a topographical map, okay? I don't know, I, I don't recall anybody ever having to use this, but if it's here, it's because someone has seen the need to have a topographical map. If you're going to, you know, if somebody has said to you, look, we want to have, um, you know, a wireless coverage on the football field so that, um, you know, when, uh, you know, on the school football field, that when parents come to watch a game of football or rugby or whatever, yeah, we want to give them access so that, you know, they can take photos and upload to Instagram or whatever it might be. If you want to do something like that, then a topographical map is not going to help you, you know, that much because it's pretty straightforward. But there will be occasions where it's not that straightforward and this would make sense. Horses for courses. If you need it, make sure that you have it. There's one here that's really interesting, but link analysis software. Of course, we, we need that as well. Calculators, um, you know, Again, if you don't have a, a mobile phone, I'd, I haven't seen a calculator sold separately to a mobile phone in years. But I don't know if they still make calculators, but if not, use the one on your mobile phone. This, is, this next one is a really interesting maximum tree growth data. So when I first looked at this, it, like, why on earth would you need that? Well, imagine that they've just planted trees if you think about uh, here's a good example do you think you remember the um apple when they created their new you know building that round building they made you know apple orchards they planted hundreds and thousands of apples uh, apple trees you know within that um with within the within the the interns you know internal diameter of that of that building well if you'd done a site survey before they did all of that you know, there wouldn't have been any trees. If you did it three months after they planted the baby trees, well, there wouldn't be much. The trees haven't grown much. But if you think about, well, those trees are going to grow. <laughs> They're going to become really big trees. And when you have hundreds and hundreds of that, that's attenuation as well. So you can actually get data that 
tells you the maximum tree growth rate. It'll tell you, well, this tree is going to grow, you know, so tall, so thick, so wide, uh, so much foliage over the next 18 months or two years or three years. That, believe it or not, can really help you because there's going to be attenuation. If you do your calculations and you consider that, then when you when you put in your access points, your external antennas, you already take cognizance of this. So I will over-spec the external antennas today because I know that in 18 months' time or two years' time, those trees will be two meters high or three meters high, some bark been bearing fruit already, and they will cause much more attenuation. It's a really interesting thing. I would never have thought about something like that. But there you go. Come to Academy. You can learn lots of different, uh, lots of different things. Binoculars speaks for itself. A signal generator and what meter. Variable loss attenuator. An inclinometer. GPS. Spectrum analyzer. Digital camera. Same as, as previously. And a sunlight reflector or a torch. Now, if it's sunlight, you're not going to need a torch, but there might be locations outside where you might need to do that, right? Where you might need a torch. So these are kind of basics. And, and you might think, well, you know, that's... This comes from people with experience. Learn from them. Don't pay school fees twice. Extreme Academy doesn't charge you anything. So don't go and pay school fees by making mistakes and having to do, do jobs again. Do it right first time. Get it, get it bang on the money. I did say previously that we would talk a little bit more about these two. E-K-A-H-A-U. Ekahau. If you're in the wireless industry, if you're in the wireless, if you're a professional, then you will know the name Ekahau. Really, really a big name in wireless surveys, as is Air Magnet. Now, on those two diagrams that you see on screen, the Air Magnet you'll see is the diagram they have there is a three-dimensional one with various flaws. Ekahau has, uh, has exactly the same thing, but I'm just trying to, to show you. Now, Air Magnet is done by a company called Flute. Now, Fluke, Fluke Networks. Now, if you've ever done installations of a, of a network or worked with somebody doing installations, chances are that if they're a big company, they will always have Fluke equipment. I've used Fluke equipment. It's really, really nice gear, but it is really, really uh, expensive e e gear. But if you want the best, that's what you use. So if you want to make sure that all your wireless cables are working, that, that there's no wiring issues and things like that, Fluke Networks make the, the physical, the hardware tools for that. And they also make air magnet. Ekahau also make a, a range of tools, but they are really, really uh, big in, in, uh, in the industry, a global leader. So both of those are really good. Now, what about... Um, AP placement. What are the best practices? People love best practices, right? And people love them because these are practices that are based on human experience. When you design something, you learn and you learn and you learn and you learn as you go along. And then you create a document that says, these are the best practices that I learned from what I've done. Remember, a best practice is no substitute for a site survey. Don't think you can do a best practice and then you don't have to do a site survey. You do, you know, and that's good. It's good for you to get out the office, go and, and see the, you know, these, these spots and do this type of stuff. But um, it's really, it's really important, these, these best uh, practices and learn from these best, best practices. Now, in, when you roll out a wireless network, um, hopefully you would have learned by now that it is preferable to roll out a 5 gigahertz wireless network rather than a 2.4 gigahertz network. It is preferable. But that doesn't mean that that's all you've got to do. Because what are you going to do with devices that only talk on 2.4? Well, if everybody in your company has got laptops, then definitely they can do five five gigahertz. And reason, you know, I mean, five gigahertz has been around for a long time. So if all you have is laptops, great, you can go with five. If everybody has a mobile phone, great, you can go with five. 
if the devices, wireless devices that you have, if they also do five, great, then you can go fantastic for five. But maybe in reception, you need to have a 2.4 because you can't always control what guests come in with, right? So if a guest comes in with a laptop, it should have five and a mobile phone should have five as well. But maybe you want to be a little bit more flexible and provide some 2.4. Having said that, your channel, how you set up your channels is very, very important. And it's just on about 20, 25 minutes. So we're going to take another 60 minute stretch break, uh, 60 minutes, 60 seconds stretch break. Get up off the chair, stand up. Come on, get up off the chair. I know, I know you can't see me. I know I can't see you, but come on, get up out the chair. Just stand up, stretch. Come on, if you've got an Apple Watch, go around, you know, walk around for a minute, come back so that you can tick off that you've done your hourly, um, your hourly one minute. I'll see you on the other side of this. Where else, where else but academies we worried about, about your health. Okay, before that little break, this is where we, uh, this is where we were, we were talking about channels. We were going to start talking about channels. Now, what I'm going to do on this, uh, on this slide is I'm actually going to, um, I'm going to go to the next one and then I think I'll come back to this or maybe just go over this a little one, um, uh, a, a couple of points over here. First of all, when you do, when you implement an SSID, a wireless LAN, an SSID, what you need to do is you're going to have multiple access points. Okay. Now, it is very good practice to minimize the amount of SSIDs. Very good practice. One is better than two and two is better than three. So if you can do that, do that. But it's important that what's even more important than that, or just as important in that is as that, is that the way you set up your access points, don't you shouldn't make the same mistakes that Isaac made when he set up his first access points. I had to set up, I think one of my first major jobs was setting up a, uh, a, a hall, quite a big hall, like a reception area out of an auditorium. People came into this auditorium and then when they left, they went into this massive reception area where there were coffees and, and cakes and, and tea and all of that. And there were literally, you know, hundreds of people that could come in there. And so they wanted wireless network access in, uh, in that location. And uh, I went in and I put up four access points, bought four access points, put them up. But before I put them up, I logged into each one. I looked at it and said, oh, okay, I see that the power is only set to 11 dBs. Oh, man, let me slide it to maximum. Put it to 20 dBs, each one of these access points. Mistake number one, right? Put everything up. You know, can you get access? Oh, yeah, it worked great. One person inside there. Yeah, great. Oh, no, thank you very much. Great. Oh, my word. The first time they used that auditorium and they came outside, it was an, oh, I didn't tell you. The other mistake that I made is I put all four access points on the same channel. So like, oh, okay, let's see the channel that they have here. They have one, two, three, four, seven, 10, 11. Oh, let's pick, uh, let's pick channel five. Let's put all four access points on channel five. That's what I did. And I thought I was being clever. You can see the problems, right? 
oh my word, the first time that that they they packed out that auditorium, the first time people came out, my phone nearly melted. Isaac, it's not working. What do we do? I don't know. It was working. Uh, reboot the access point. Okay, reboot the access point. Ten minutes later, Isaac, the other one's not working. Now what do we do? Uh, uh, reboot the access point. And all I could say until I got to site was reboot the access point, reboot the access point, reboot the access point. I'm trying to help you here. I'm, I'm trying to save you a lot of pain and a lot of tears. What I should have done is I should have avoided cross-channel interference, all right, CCI, by spacing out the channels so that they don't overlap okay now you know that on the 2.4 gigahertz there are 11 channels 11 separate channels okay of 20 megahertz for each channel now between one and two there's overlap between one and three there's overlap between one and four, there's overlap. One and five, there is still some overlap between them. But channel one and channel six have no overlap at all. Channel one and channel six have no overlap. And channel six and channel 11 have no overlap at all. So what was I doing? I was putting all four access points onto the same channel, channel five, and I was just causing massive interference from, from that. It was a nightmare, okay? It was a nightmare. And eventually we had to switch off access points and all sorts of things to try and get that to work. I didn't get a very good reputation because of that. But let me go to the next slide and then come back to, to this one. I, I zoom this in. I would take a screenshot if I were you. I zoom this in. Have a look at what I want to show you over here. Let's look at the first section there, which says 2.4 gigahertz channel allocation. For the 2.4 gigahertz, it, it has 80 megahertz of spectrum, okay, available to it. Now, look at that, where it says um, uh, um, quantity, right and then it says three so what we're saying there is on the 2.4 gigahertz channel or or spectrum or, or, or frequency band there are three channels three 20 megahertz channels that do not overlap each other okay channel one channel six and channel 11 and there it says center frequency so what is the center frequency of channel one you can see it there it's two four one two channel six and channel 11 that's the center frequency so if you were going to do a deployment and you were going to do 2.4 gigahertz and you were going to do say three access points then those are the same ssid don't change the ssid same SSID on channel one, the first access point, the second one on channel six, and the next one on channel 11. Okay. Now think about this in the context of what we've learned before of how busy that airspace is on the 2.4 because it's been going on for years and years and years. Every device talks on the 2.4. So what do you have? You have a frequency allocation you have three channels and every device broadcasts and talks on those channels from your tv to microwave to your apple watch to whatever they all talk on the 2.4 that's what we mean when we say the 2.4 gigahertz is an incredibly busy space and why if you can you should go to five look at the five look at the five over here let's look at this make sure you screenshot this five we have 500 megahertz of uh, of uh, of spectrum to play with right look at the quantity in five in five gigahertz we have 25 non-overlapping channels 25 non-overlapping channels now we know about dfs right radar so if radar radar is also allocated to some of those so what will happen is if 
if you're on one of those channels which are available to you and radar something you know happens a government <laughs> parks a radar station next to your house and the radar needs to come on then by default your access points need to get off of those channels and move to other channels they'll do this aut automatically you don't have to you know go in and, and change it they will do that automatically they basically got to step back let the radar take its course and then ask is it okay to come back if it is they can come back and broadcast there but you get the idea 25 channels of 20 megahertz 40 megahertz you get 11 channels so if you need extra bandwidth for example i think the bt um, access points they take 80 megahertz remember david said in last week's um in last week's lesson he said that very high bandwidth applications might even require something like 160 uh, megahertz channels you know and maybe virtual reality you know augmented reality those things might might require that much bandwidth but for your home use for a baby monitor you don't need that 20 megahertz is absolutely fine so is 40 but just look at the difference okay can you see why you would want to if you greenfield if you're building new why this would make so much sense to you to use this spectrum because you have so many more channels that don't overlap and then look at what happens when you go to the six gigahertz you have 12 100 megahertz of spectrum that you can use and look at this 20 megahertz channels you have 59 so the us brazil uh qatar the arab emirates and many nations around the world are following the the us's lead and brazil's lead and and opening up that entire six gigahertz spectrum to wireless look at what that does for you it just opens up so much more so that's why we say if you can rather go on the five gigahertz rather use five gigahertz spectrum to build your your uh, your your um, your wireless LAN because the spectrum is nowhere as busy as it is on the two point uh, on the 2.4 we do say and recommend as a best practice don't uh, don't place access points based on um, on signal strength uh on on distance base them on signal strength okay distance is like yeah it, it doesn't really matter it's signal strength that you want to base them on and we would say uh place them approximately minus 70 dbms apart from each other i hope that's that's been useful to you and you've learned something from this over here let's look at an actual um you know uh, uh, a practical implementation remember i said in 2.4 you'd go 1 6 11. actually there's a better better thing a better way to do it look at this semi-directional antenna look at the bottom left access and by the way don't screenshot it yet when when the rest of the build is there then you can take a screenshot look at that access point one on channel one so this is a 2.4 um, 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 gigahertz a uh, channel right so uh, access point one we put on channel one next to it we have not x not uh not channel six but channel 11 so access point two goes to channel 11 so you have one and then you have all the space at channel 11 and then you have the one next to it is a channel six yes and next to that one you then have a channel one down the bottom look at what happens on the other side of that building you have another three access points over there and that's channel ap5 on channel six ap6 on channel one and ap7 on channel 11 and look at the v's look at the patterns do you see that there's no or very little co-channel interference because of the way that they have been set up so what's the takeaway from here the takeaway is that the channel use policy is incredibly important you have to marry this to your site survey don't think that you can just do a site survey and say oh place an access point there one there and one there and everything is okay everything is going to be okay because i checked the signal strength i checked all of those things if you do your site survey correctly you have to follow it up with doing a proper channel allocation plan 
for how you're going to distribute the channels within that same SSID. Okay, look at this next one over here, which is very easily, this could be a, a hotel. Your first access point is directional, not omnidirectional, it's just directional. And that one will point straight down that corridor. Now, many hotels, and, and I have traveled to many hotels in my life, what they will do, they, they will try and put access points in the corridor and they will put multiple access points in the corridor so they think that they can save money by putting two access points in the corridor and thereby cover um, cover every room you know what inevitably happens it's a terrible situation you get miserable uh signal strength in um in in those in those hotels it's so bad oftentimes i would just leave the room and go and sit in reception and try and get uh, uh, wireless uh, access in reception right you've probably had been in those hotels before or just buildings and, and warehouses and things like that one access point down a narrow corridor directional and then in each room an access point okay an omnidirectional access point so in this plan over here your channel your ap1 channel 6 you know directed then up left channel uh, access point 2 on channel 11 look at the spacing access point 3 channel 1 access point 4 channel uh, channel 1 access point 5 channel 11 okay you try your best to 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 keep them away from each other now if you were using 5 gigahertz you would have none of these uh, issues of, of this overlapping at all because you could space them out a lot better so I hope that this session has been helpful to you. Um, the module is really interesting and it becomes even more interesting when you, you get your hands on some of this software, on some of this equipment. For many of you, as I say, this stuff is expensive. Ekahau, you know, and, and some of these other ones, uh, Air Magnet, they are expensive pieces of software. I'm not quite sure, actually, I should have checked before I came live to check if they, if you get trial versions of them. I'm not sure, but you still need, you know, hardware like uh, USB dongles to plug into your laptop to be able to, to capture all of this data. But um, whatever it is, try and help, try and find yourself um, somebody who might have these tools, who has worked with them. Find someone, if you, you know, phone around, speak to networking companies, you know, say, listen, you know, I'm interested in, in wireless and I heard about the site survey. Do you have any engineers that are going to go out to site that I could shadow them just to go and see what they do so that you can learn? There's also many resources online on YouTube that you can go and learn about the products, what they do, how they function, and learn about site surveys, learn about experts who've done this stuff before. So I encourage you, go out further than just Extreme Academy. Here, we teach you, we excite you, we light your fire. But now it's up to you to go out and go and learn more. And in fact, that's what I'm going to offer you today for your homework, right? For your homework, I want you to go onto the sites of Ekahau and Air Magnet, download some software, uh, trial it, see how it works, see if you can get demo, you, you know, work plans uh, or floor plans that you can bring in, you know, play with it. You don't have to submit the homework back to me. Do it for you. Do it for you so that you learn, so that you understand when they talk about this stuff, you now know the language. You now know what they're talking about. You now know the ins and outs of how the software works, what it shows you. It will help you. It will build you and you'll be able to advance your career, advance your knowledge, all with the kind compliments of Extreme Academy. Thank you for watching. Thank you so much for giving us two hours of your time. We appreciate it so much. We value your time. We, we know that, you, that this time is important to you. So I'll finish on time. 
Thank you so much for all the support, for the LinkedIn messages. There's been so many messages of support for us. Uh, for those of you who've joined Discord, thank you. We will be more, get more active on there. For those of you who haven't joined Discord, you'll see right at the end, there'll be a, a URL and a QR code or whatever. Please scan that. Come and join the community as we build it. It's in its infancy. It's only been up for a week. It's still quite bare, but we're going to build it up into something where you can learn and you can grow. Thank you to everyone. Thank you to the team that works with me. Uh, Rowan, Dave, Claire. Claire is great. She's, she's, she just gets stuff done. And she's so positive. She's always encouraging me. Thanks, uh, Claire, for Paul, uh, Stuart Farmer, Ben, uh, John Barger, all these guys that are, um, you know, that, that are necessary to make this work. Thanks as well for Extreme, you know, for supporting uh, Extreme, uh, Extreme Networks. All I can say is have a great week, be safe, and see you back next week, same time, for the module on security with our special guest, David Colm. Do not miss out next week. It's going to be fantastic. Cheers. Bye-bye.